everyone, and welcome to this session um, around the truth about AI regulations and what every organization needs to know. I'm Darren Burton. I'm the Chief People Officer for Eightfold, and I'm really excited to be here today along with our special guest, Keith Solomon, the Commissioner of the EEOC. And we're so excited about this topic because AI and its impact on the field is just simply enormous. And in fact, it's probably the most significant change that I've seen in my career, and one that is attracting more and more attention from governing bodies, which is exactly why we've invited Commissioner Sonderling to discuss a few things with us. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is the focus on AI as a priority for the EEOC. Uh, the current legal landscape, which is complex and really ever-evolving. Shocking. <laughs> We're already getting into it, okay? And best practices, of course, that we should be thinking about as practitioners. And then, of course, the topic that is on everyone's mind, chat GPT. So, Keith, before we get started, tell us a bit about your journey as commissioner for the EOC. Well, I checked the entire audience here, and I'm the only one wearing a tie. <laughs> That's because none of you would believe that I came from Washington if I wasn't wearing a tie. But I try to wear a lighter tie today than just a government tie. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And to Eightfold for always being so generous, for allowing me to talk to all of you. You know, the people who are actually using this technology, the people who want to use this technology for the good of their workforce. And from our perspective in Washington, D.C., and we're going to talk about specifically all the debate around how do we legislate, how do we regulate AI, not just in D.C., but globally. You know, from my perspective, I don't want to be the reason why you don't implement this technology. I don't want to be the reason why this technology is not flourishing, being developed, and really helping the workforce. So when I got to the EEOC, and just by a quick background, I was a labor and employment management side attorney in Florida. I joined the government in 2017 at the U.S. Department of Labor labor at the Wage and Hour Division, which a lot of you in HR know as well. In uh, September of 2020, I was confirmed by the U.S. Senate to be a commissioner on the U.S. EEOC. And when I got to the EEOC, you know, I really, you, the prior panel was talking about purpose and wh what is our purpose. I looked at the EEOC's mission statement, and the EEOC's mission statement is to prevent and remedy employment discrimination and promote equal employment opportunity for all. And from my perspective of having been a lawyer and having dealt with HR, and I think a lot of you can attest to this, most of your experiences with the EEOC has been what? Uh-oh, we got a charge of discrimination. We did something wrong. Our employees are suing us. Now the lawyers are going to get involved. And now, you know, everything we're trying to work is done. So the EEOC has really been looked at because it is a law enforcement agency at our core. I don't want to undermine that as well. And we do have 2,000 investigators out there watching <laughs> all of you to make sure you're doing it right. And about four or 500 lawyers, but I can keep going. The, um, you know, but looking at our mission, nobody was looking at the prevent side of it, you know, just the remedy side. And then the second part of it, to promote equal employment opportunity for all. And when I looked at that, I was like, wait a minute, that's what HR does, right? And that's very aligned with what HR's mission is within a corporation, especially on the equal employment opportunity side. So why aren't we talking to HR more? Why aren't we out there engaging with the HR community instead of just government affairs teams in Washington, D.C. And, and lawyers? So that's what I really tried to make a difference in there. When I did that, talking to CHROs, talking to general counsels, talking to this community, the number one issue was technology and AI. And this is before ChatGPT, as all of you know. And how are we going to implement this technology for our workforce? And there were so many questions. And what I found was that with the lack of guidance, the lack of understanding of how this technology works and how it can actually be very beneficial to the workforce and help us in DC at our at, from the government level, people would really wanted those questions answered. So that's why I started to dive into this world head on. And, and now you know, I'm excited to talk about a lot of the ways where this can really help our mission to prevent employment discrimination. Well, it's, it's really amazing and how times have changed because when I first started my career, one of the last things that um, one of my employers would have told me is to actively engage with the EEOC. And there's a lot of companies that still feel that way. But, <laughs> but things have changed. So, and, and clearly this is a priority for you. Yeah. And so talk about just the importance in the context of employment discrimination sure. related to AI. 
Yeah, and it's no longer a question, are you going to use HR technology, or are you going to use artificial intelligence in the workplace? That ship has sailed. You know, to be competitive, you have to use it. Now the question from my purpose is what technology you're going to use and for what purpose, and how is it going to comply with longstanding civil rights laws? Because you know, my, unlike other uses of AI um, it, within your business that you're looking about buying to make deliveries faster, to, to do all these different you know, accounting functions, when you're dealing with AI in HR, you're dealing with some of the most fundamental civil rights we have in this country. And what is that? It's to enter in the thrive and in the workforce without being discriminated right. against. So, you know, from, from my perspective now, I want to be able to answer those questions and really dive in with HR professionals so you can understand what the consequences are for using various technology. Now, it is still a free country. If you want to use AI for the wrong purpose, you can, you shouldn't, and you will, there will be consequences. But you know, th that's what a lot of the big lingering questions are there, and how can it actually help us get to this skills-based approach, which you know, you're going to talk about throughout this conference, yeah. and help remove some of the long-standing bias in the workforce. Because the reason my agency exists from the 1960s, born out of the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King uh, marching in Washington, DC, is to prevent bias in the workforce. And guess what? It's still there. In the last two years, we've collected over a billion dollars from employers for discriminating and bias violating um, these laws. So the issue is there. So I'm trying to look at this differently than, than some of the other conversations in DC around AI about, oh, it's going to you know, cause so much harm. Well, what about the good it can cause? What about how it can actually help us prevent discrimination by removing so many of these historical barriers that have really hindered people from different socioeconomic backgrounds from entering the workforce? So we've had this conversation quite a bit. And you have written and you've spoken extensively on something called the delegatory approach related to AI. So it's really about looking at the existing framework that we have for non-discrimination and using that framework when we're evaluating AI. So talk a bit about that to the audience. Yeah, and this is something I talk about globally because I think you know with the potential regulations coming related to the AI, new laws, you know, that is just a huge distraction. And something you, you hear, you know, from my colleagues in Congress in DC, they're just saying, well, if we see these companies' algorithms, if we can get into their proprietary data, then we can show you how their AI discriminates. We can show you how this is causing harm. Well, okay, show it to me as a, as a lawyer. What am I, it's just a bunch of numbers. I don't know what any of that means. Right? And in that sense, when there's so much uncertainty about, well, are we going to have to disclose the algorithms? Are we going to have to disclose data sets? All these different things. It's a distraction from the laws that, have, that exist right now that all of you as HR professionals know and know how to do. And that's look for bias in the results. Because all of our EEOC investigators and lawyers and class action lawyers, judges, at the end of the day, None of us know technology. None of us know, you know what the secret algorithm code is that makes all these decisions, but what we know is results. And in a way, if there is employment discrimination, there's there, if there's bias in the, in, the, in the results, how do we get there, right? How do we backtrack it now? Was it somebody intentionally discriminating, or was it a policy and procedure that wound up discriminating against a certain group? That's all we're left with now. And the difficulty that we face now, and that we've faced since the 1960s, of since these laws have been uh, enabled, is how do we get there? And right now, the only way we get there is, Darren, did you discriminate when you didn't hire that person because she was a woman? Yes or no? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Who would admit that? <laughs> right? Oh, yes, I discriminated against her or him. It's just not how it works. And you know, and when you look at the black box of AI, what about the black box of somebody's brain? We'll never know what that final decision was. Was it whether that person really wasn't qualified or that person was biased towards that person's religion. So right now, we're not really faced with a great situation. That's where technology can really come in. And this is where I'm trying to move the fear away from AI of how, you know, of well, it needs to be transparent. We need to know what it's making. It's true in a way, if we have AI and you actually are using AI to say, okay, well, here's the skills we need for this job. Here's the candidates that have it. Here's what the machine learning is looking at the resumes. What are you creating? And we saw the, the data sets and all the trillions of um, terabytes of data, but you're also now creating a record here. So in, in a sense, if you are faced with a claim of discrimination, you know, before you have that old method of trying to get somebody to admit they discriminated versus, well, here's what we put in the algorithm. Here's what we look. Here are the skills that we looked, we, we thought was best for the job. 
And here's what the, uh, you know, here's the clicks we did to make sure that it's matching up the jobs with the, jo the skills with the job description. A and here's the results. And that can make this process a lot more transparent. And from a law enforcement perspective and from an investigative side, we don't have that clarity now. So in a sense, I'm trying to convince employers to embrace this technology to help us as well to make sure that everything is well documented and it actually shows that, hey, this is what we thought was best for the job and this is what the algorithm decided opposed to trying to back so Keith, to that point, you've spoken quite a bit about this, the next step really is around self-audit. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that because I you know, truly believe in self-audit because again, if you really don't necessarily understand the algorithms, but you can look at the results and then use a self-auditing process within your system, it will deliver the kind of results that we're looking for. So just talk a little bit about, uh, about that. It goes back to the uh, misunderstanding that there's no existing framework right now. So in all other aspects of your business right now, you do audits before you deploy something, you know, whether it's, it's a new pharmaceutical drug, it's a new product. A lot of time, whether you're forced by the government or not, you're testing those internally before it ever actually goes out in the market. And with HR, you know, a lot of times companies are doing these audits to begin with, right? If you think about uh, all the hot topics now relating to pay equity, right? B employers are doing compensation audits internally to make sure that they're not discriminating against in pay right before any government intervention, before they're required to by the EEOC, other state and local agencies. And that's a really good thing because what does it do? It allows you to be in control and allows you to see if there are problems, you can correct them and then you know people can get paid equally or whatever the audit is. And there, there's not a need for that government investigation and then we can use our resources for people who are not doing that. So you know, with AI, for some reason, I think a lot of it is because potentially what um, New York is requiring, what we've talked about in other countries, yeah. is this requirement for an audit. It's like, well, we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to audit AI. What are we going to do? You know, all these new auditing requirements, this is so novel, but it's not. You know, there's nothing preventing you from before ever deploying one of these systems, before ever allowing one of these systems to make someone's, a decision on someone's livelihood, to go through and test it first. And we've seen a lot of good examples, some have become very public, of companies really making sure that before this ever actually, you know, makes an employment decision, to the extent it does, to make sure that it's actually compliant, it's not discriminating, because if you see there's bias, if you see for some reason it's uh, picking one group over the other, not based upon a reason, not based upon a skill, not based upon a job description, it's just the, you know, the lay of the land. You've all heard the very classic uh, examples of, of some of the misuse of this. You know, the most infamous example, and who knows if it's even true at this point, it's just because I'm such a legendary story, is you know, one company was uh, asked machine learning to go through its uh, top you know, salespeople and say, you know, what are the patterns that make these people so great? Find us the skills and, uh, and why these are top performers. And the AI came back and said, the most likely indicators of success at your company is being named Jared and having played high school across. <laughs> Obviously, that is not a good metrics to, to, to hire somebody on. Or the alleged Amazon example, too, where they used machine learnings to go through uh, all their um, right. resumes that applied for a certain job, and it automatically lowered women because if you went to a women's college, women's sports team, any indicator of being a woman, it lowered because the data set of the people who applied for the job was very men. So a lot of this is not new. And you can go through and actually do it yourself and use these programs internally before to see if it's actually doing what you're saying it's doing. And a lot of that is really being um, lost in the equation when you're comfortable doing that for other products, other lines of your business, or even um, with HR. Just think about uh, overtime audits to make sure that people are getting paid the proper overtime or working the hours. Everyone's familiar with that, but with, HR, with AI technology, it's like, oh, we don't know what to do. But it's, it's the same result, it's the same output. And that should take a lot of the fear away from you know, using this and, and being concerned about it. And in a sense, too, you can really tinker with some of the, the metrics before going live. So, you know, there's programs out there about, you know, making sure that you have a diverse applicant pool and, you know, why are people applying or not applying to certain jobs? You know, you could AI to, you, to de gender some of the terms or change some of the terms, change some of the job requirements. Like, instead of three years of Python, you get one year of Python, and how does it increase your diversity? And then how can you upskill them once you get there? So, you can test beforehand to really see how it changes those diversity metrics. Uh, in a good way, opposed to saying at the end, oh, we didn't have a single woman in our applicant pool, 
and now you're in trouble. So this part of the conversation really resonates with me because I always believe in a risk mitigation framework. Regardless of what you know, new change you're introducing to your business, you should always be monitoring risk and understanding the impact. Um, was it intended or unintended? And really having processes in place to be able to monitor that. And here's why it's so complicated. Under our laws, whether you intend to discriminate or you do not intend to discriminate, you are still liable. And that's why it's so tricky. And that's why, you know, I I've been advocating for using this technology at scale to really go through and to see how you can prevent that from ever occurring, what you metrics you can change where you couldn't do that before. You know, when you post a job advertisement, it's out there. It's done. Job advertisements are federally protected. So the EEOC is going to hold you to every line in that job description and every skill requirement in that job description to see if it's really necessary for the job or it's actually causing discrimination. So let's shift the conversation a bit and talk about the legal landscape, which is complex and it is evolving very quickly. Um, talk I'm about at an HR conference in San Francisco. You want to so it's bring me back to DC and talk about the <laughs> I law, do. talking about good I do. use of AI. We have to touch on this, right? So talk about what's happening in the US. Everyone's familiar with what's happening in New York. Yep. Talk about what's happening globally. Just give us a sense for what the legal landscape looks like right now. Well, you know, there's been some people in the government like myself who have been really trying to dive into this um, for years and trying to make sure that, you know, our laws are, that are on the books, because I'm not in Congress, I can't make new laws, although a lot of people would like to at these agencies, I don't, I respect the separation of powers and saying, you know, here's our existing framework. So I've been, you know, pretty consistent talking about that. But now with everything in the news related to ChatGPT, um, you're really seeing a huge push towards regulating uh, artificial intelligence. You know, from the White House last year, they put out a, a Bill of Rights, which was very generic, a lot of high-level topics of how AI should be designed, which I think most developers and designers of these programs um, would agree with, transparency, trust, you know, a lot of these um, bigger buzzwords. But now with ChatGPT, from a federal perspective, you're seeing, you know, a more narrow, targeted approach. You're seeing all the agencies now putting out statements, whether it's the FTC and the advertising, whether it's the FDA with use in medical devices, whether it's HUD use in housing or the EEOC use of employment, really putting out statements saying that we're watching this, we understand this is a really big issue, and we're going to use our resources on there. But as far as some sort of global legislation related to AI, um, le leader Sh uh, Chuck Schumer in the Senate has said he's going to put some framework out there. There's been other bills to globally regulate AI in the United States that have not passed. But as you know, uh, in Washington, D.C., we could barely get a budget passed every year. So I don't know if we're going to be able to actually do a new framework on our artificial intelligence. And that goes back to where it should be at all the different agencies. So, you know, whatever, we have a lot of different agencies in D.C. And each of those agencies, it's upon all of us to say, this is the existing framework and this is how it's applying to your specific use across the board. Now, it's a little different um, globally and in with the states. And this is what you're seeing now is a lot of states really trying to get ahead of this and really trying to get ahead of it in the area that a lot of, that's going to affect the most people, that is the easiest un to understand, and what do you know that's in HR? Mm. So originally we saw in the state of Illinois come out pretty early as one of the first to say, you know, for employment interviews that use facial recognition, they're going to make it almost impossible to use, you know, so much disclosures and basically banning facial recognition in employment at, um, interviews through Zoom. And then uh, Maryland came out with something significant. But then, you know, the city of New York really was the most aggressive. And it, at one point we should commend, you know, states and cities for trying to tackle tackle this very complicated issue. But for national employers, it just creates this patchwork that is very difficult to understand um, and implement as well. So New York came out with um, the first ever really law relating to um, artificial intelligence in hiring and in promotions. And, and the law has been pushed back. There's been a lot of controversy over if it applies outside of New York or who it applies to or what an audit is. But basically now it's pushed to um, implementation in July. And the core of that, it's really going to require not only disclosure to employees who are being subject to this technology so they know that an algorithm is making some sort of their hiring decision, but it, the, the, I don't want to say the controversial part, but the real part that people are struggling with is the pre-deployment audits. And you know, who's, who's going to do an independent audit? What is that audit going to look like? And you know, in, in this area, obviously, it's very complicated. And you know, everyone's like, okay, New York, you're going to create this new framework and a new AI audit. What does that look like? And then, you know, 
time goes by, well, what does it look like in New York? Uh, look to the EEOC, well, how they audit, right? So in, in a sense, you know, if you're going to do something, and then the other part, it only requires audit on race, ethnicity, in hiring and promotion. And here's where, again, when I talked about the distraction earlier, you know, for all of you as employers, well, guess what? The EEOC cares about the entire employment life cycle, literally from the, the moment you post a job description through being hired, through being promoted, through being de promote, uh, uh, demoted, your bonuses, your training, your benefits, the entire life cycle. So it may pe th cause people to think in New York, well, we only need to care about the laws relating to race and ethnicity um, in promotion and hiring. Well, guess what? Federal law still applies in New York and here in California, although they may not think it sometimes. The, um, you know, we, we care about all statuses, you know, in, in benefits, training, promotions, and not just sex and not just race, uh, disability, religion, you know, national origin, LGBT status, all these things that we have to look at that employers are also liable for are not required in some of these you know, laws as well. And then here in California, shockingly, there's proposals about how to regulate AI, and there's some bills going through that would require an AI governance committee, but also this deployment, pre-deployment audit, yearly audits, and posting results of that. So a lot of it, look, it's good. It causes attention to be looked at this very complicated um, area, but then also, well, am I, if I have to do this in New York, do I do it the rest of the country where the EEOC says you have to? Now, the other issue, too, is for, and there's a lot of global employers in this room, is in Europe. Just like GDPR, Europe is trying to get ahead of this as well and have the Brussels effect of trying to lead um, the world when it comes to AI regulation, and they're being very aggressive about it. And they have um, an actual act, which would be just a new law uh, related to AI, and what's different than here in the United States, and we don't really have this, um, is a risk-based approach, where the government is going to say, you know, there's different levels of risk of using AI, from the lowest to the highest to completely unacceptable. And we're, as the government, we're going to classify each risk. So, you know, the unacceptable risk would be some of the social scoring issues you, you see in some countries. And, but they've said use of employment would be in the highest risk category possible. Well, what does that mean? That means you would then have to do audits, you'd have to have more disclosures, and there would just be a lot more work related to it. And um, that obviously would be binding in Europe, and they have a long way to go as far as implementation. But you just see the different ways to approach this, and there's no global uh, consensus, or even here in the United States. But from my position, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, forget about all that. Because our laws apply right now to the decisions you're using humans to make, or computers to make, or robots to make, and it's just as simple as that. Well, given that complexity and how things are evolving, especially even globally, um, the, the premise of really relying on the existing framework and making sure that organizations are providing self-auditing uh, is really important. Is there any downside to self-auditing that you see? Um, you know, the, 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 there's always a debate about this, you know, would you rather know or not know that these issues, you know, that right. you have problems within your organization. But again, it's not, it, it's no different than auditing any other area. And for me, right. I'm a huge proponent of it. I think that if, if there is discrimination occurring, if there is unequal pay, if there are any of these issues and you find it, it benefits ultimately the employees who are subject to that discrimination or the subject who, who are not getting paid properly, right? So you fix that. But from a corporate perspective, you're getting that liability off your book. If you know you have a problem and you can have you can fix it, if the government comes or if class action lawyers comes, you, you know you could say yes, we found it, we fixed it, we we, right. we changed our hiring procedures, you know we we pay these people the wages they weren't given, no problem, go away. It's not that easy, but you know what I mean. So. So clearly there's been, you know, some, you know, things that are written about the potential negative impacts of yep. AI and employment. But let's just talk a bit about, you know, some of the positive sides that you see uh, if an organization wants to implement AI. Yeah. And like I said, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan uh, of AI. I think it's the future. I think that, you know, companies really can use it to help us at the EEOC, like where I started, to help promote equal employment opportunity. And that's what I really think AI does. And some of the, and, and you know, this is a sophisticated crowd, but the very basic issues with bias in the workplace. A male and a female resume apply for the same job. The male is more likely to get selected. African Americans and Asian Americans who whiten their resume, and what I mean by that, they remove any indicators of their national origin or clubs are associated with, are more likely to get selected without those characteristics that are on there than if they were on there. And you know, an example I like to use, and, and it's very simple but very easy to understand, is a, a name on a resume. You know, what does a name tell you about a person's ability to do the job? 
Nothing. What it does tell you is a lot of the things the EEOC has said you are not allowed to make an employment decision on. Your sex, the race, the potential religion, national origin, you could figure out a lot from a name. So just you know, using AI to forget what the person's name is or to ignore some of those characteristics that may associate you with a protected class can really help individuals get past these barriers that have prevented them getting the workforce. And another example I like to use too is just even you know, on you know, looking at a resume, but also during the, the first interaction. And a lot of times, you know, past the resume, the first time you see somebody is before the pandemic, you walk into the room. So you walk into a room for an interview, and I see a lot about you again basically everything the EEOC says you're not allowed to make an employment decision on. And also, you know, if you're pregnant, if you're disabled, if you're religiously observant, and I can't un ever unsee that, right? And at the end of the day, it may, it's a lot easier for me as a hiring manager, again, in the black box of my brain, to say, you know, I'm gonna go with you over you because you're not gonna need pregnancy, you know, accommodations in three months. You know, you're not gonna use and need an expensive adaptive device because you have a disability. And before we never knew because you're saying, well, you're more qualified than the other person, and that's what I'm gonna write down on paper, and that's the end of the story. But using AI, it doesn't see any of that. It doesn't know that you know, you're, you're pregnant. It doesn't know that you're disabled. It doesn't know that you're religiously observant. And so many of these barriers, historically, that have prevented people get in, it can actually switch to that skills-based approach, which, by the way, is what the law requires. Are you qualified for the job? not who you are, where you, you come from, or any socioeconomic background that has put you in this position, do you have the underlying qualifications? And that's where really AI can remove all of these qualifications that, uh, that have prevented people to get in based on historical bias. Like I said, you know, we have between 70 to 100,000 cases of discrimination every single year. So it's happening. So I look at it as a positive, what can we do to help and this is sort of controversial. How do we eliminate the EEOC? Why should we exist anymore, right? If the EEOC is gone, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble for this, <laughs> then there's no bias in employment, right? So that's where ultimately we're trying to go, and that is what the mission of HR as well. And you, know, you heard from the prior panel about trying to diversify skills, diversify talent. A lot of that comes by removing you know, are you man or female? Right. Well, you know, the benefit that many of our clients are actually experiencing is the ability to focus on skills and abilities. So right. what a person has the capability of doing uh, versus what the person has done before, which could have been based on some bias in the system. So Correct. And, you know, what, what are the, you know, moving the conversation to now, what are the actual underlying skills? Well, AI can actually help us get there by using machine learning and looking across the board to see, well, what are the real skills of that job opposed to what have the skills been historically because those companies, how do you create a job description? How do you find out what the skills were? Well, let's just copy what our competitors are doing. Let's go on LinkedIn and just copy that job description, right? And, but you have no idea what historical biases from that company you're now putting into your company that's gonna prevent people from getting in, in the workforce that have no relevancy to your business in that location for that job. And that's what we look for there. And that's what technology can really help us do at scale. So with the few minutes we have left, we cannot escape this conversation without talking about ChatGPT. So I don't know what that we, is. We had our first conversation <laughs> in January about this, right? And then when I look back and think about November of last year is when the launch actually occurred, how things have just accelerated so quickly. So would love for you to tell the attendees just what's your perspective on the use of chat GPT in the employment process? Do you want the HR hat or the legal hat? Let's give us both. <laughs> From the HR side, there's obviously a lot of benefits. It's been yeah. very well written about, about, you know, just across the board, people doing their jobs, and it helps to some of the mundane tasks, and they can actually then upskill and reskill and, and do things that they, they actually would have a career satisfaction on. But let's talk about, you know, the serious consequences on the legal side of this. And, aside, and I'm not going to get into the data and the privacy concerns because that's outside of my wheelhouse of literally typing all your confidential information into outer space and everyone have access to it. I would highly, uh, you know, make sure that you have policies and procedures because your employees may be doing um, that as well. But it just needs to be governance around it. It, it. Although it is a new technology, at the end of the day, it's not going to be anything different than how companies implemented the internet or email on there. And, you know, it's how are you going to, as employers, make sure that it's being used properly and who has 
has access to those systems, and it's not being used for wrong. But in the HR context, I do have serious concerns about using ChatGBT unfiltered for creating job descriptions, for doing performance reviews. Although it sounds really easy, and ChatGPT seems very smart, um, smarter than all of us, say, go make me the best job description for this position. And ChatGPT makes a job description, and you copy and paste, and you put it on, out there. Who the hell knows what you know, you're asking for, where that information came from? And again, like I said in the prior example, you are going to be held for every line in that job description. So if there's things that says ChatGPT says, you know, based upon our data set, we think this is a great indicator, you really need to look at it. And you really need to say, well, where is this coming from? Is this relevant? Or is this actually going to cause discrimination? Or even for doing performance reviews. Do me a, a, the best perform performance review for this project manager in this industry. And here you go, copy and paste. You know, again, you don't know what bias is. You don't know what that's implementing there. But at the end of the day, and I'll leave it with this, we don't care. You're liable. OK, so whatever you, you're using for chat, it's that simple. <laughs> right? And I could say that for my position. And it's true because that's what the law requires. So whatever you're taking from ChatGPT and making, using it to make an employment decision, whether it's compensation, performance reviews, or even job advertising, um, that you, we're going to hold you to that. And again, you don't know where that's coming from, and you don't know how that's going to impact your individual workforce. So every single line, every single word you're using something from ChatGPT in the HR function, you really need to make sure that at the end of the day, it has its intended purpose, and it doesn't cause bias. So I know that we're at time, but just one more thing. Just touch on some best practices as far as uh, professionals in HR really wanting to just stay abreast yeah. of everything that's happening because things are moving so quickly. What's your advice there? From the corporate side, I would um, start drafting policies and procedures just like you have an employment handbook, just like you have, like I said earlier, the use of technology. Um, make sure that, especially with HR, AI systems, the people who have access to these systems are trained properly because you could have the most beautifully designed AI talent system that really completely eliminates bias. But if I'm a, you know, if I'm, I'm bad actor, and I go in there and I say, okay, well, now I'm going to use this to, to filter out women or filter out Asian Americans. You pick your protected category. With a few clicks, you could do that at scale. And from an employer perspective, you don't want to be liable, just like sexual harassment or the other things, for a rogue actor. And, you know, when a manager sexually harasses an employee, you know, you have policies and procedures, you have open door policies to mitigate that risk from this one bad actor. And the same thing needs to happen um, with AI as well. And I really push on the vendors too, to help you create these programs and policies, to help you train the employees who are going to be using these systems. So I think, you know, really good vendors out there will be encouraging to do that and want to help you implement that and want to help you build those uh, fair use and governance policies around the use of AI um, in the workplace. Well, Keith, Commissioner Sonderling, thank you so much for your time today. I know that um, the team will find this very insightful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.